In the long storied history of Chicago sports, no athlete embodied the image of Carl Sandburg Chicago more than Walter Payton. No athlete ran as swift, as savage, or as sweet. climbed higher heights to reach the unreachable. Probably the best running back combination ever in the league would be Walter Payton and any other back. He was the best overall football player I've ever seen. There will be no other durable back to do the kind of things he's done in his incredible life. Quick pitch to Walter, looking for the record, cuts back, he's got it! Walter Payton becomes the National Football League all-time leading rusher surpassing Jim Brown. Peyton's long and winding journey to NFL greatness began in the deltas of Mississippi, prospered alongside the skyscrapers of Chicago, and concluded in a hall in the small Ohio town of Canton. Not only is my dad an exceptional athlete, he's a role model. He's my biggest role model and best friend. We made a wager who would be the first one to, uh, to break down in tears. And after hearing my son get up here and talk, I don't care if I lose the bet. I think he just wanted to be the best there ever was. That was his pure motivation. Walter Jerry Payton was born on July 25, 1954 in Columbia, Mississippi to Peter and Aileen Payton. He began playing football in the 11th grade, but even before young Walter strapped on his pads, he already had perfected his moves, playing the simple game of tag. I was always the last one to get caught, and if you got caught, you was it, and you had to catch everybody else. And I knew how hard it was, so I never did want to get caught. So I would just be running and fading and sliding under and jumping over and just trying to get away. In 1971, he enrolled at Jackson State University. And from the very beginning, he dominated, thanks in large part to his most influential football mentor. We had a coach there by the name of uh, Robert Hill who uh, he had a different philosophy in terms of uh, coaching. Hill placed little importance on non-contact drills, believing that the best way to nurture a successful football team was to have them play a lot of football. Monday, we scrimmage. Tuesday, we scrimmage. Wednesday, we scrimmage. Thursday, we scrimmage. As a four-year starter, Peyton averaged over six yards a carry, rushed for over 3,500 yards, and attracted other top prospects to the program. Everyone was talking about this hot, new, sensational running back that, that they had, and sure enough, he was a pretty special. I remember thinking, man, wouldn't it be nice to go there and be on the team with him? And I got to meet him and saw what a neat guy he was, and I said, man, I, I sure like to play with him. And he ended up uh, getting a chance to block for him. Walter finished his college career as the leading scorer in NCAA history, piling up an astounding 66 touchdowns in only 43 games. From 1971 to 74, Peyton and the Tigers won 33 games while losing just nine. During that same four-year span, the Chicago Bears lost 38 games. The monsters of the Midway had not had a winning season in 10 years, and they looked to a young back from the South to provide salvation. 
Our team finished the 1974 season on a very bad note. We made the decision at that time that we must change. We must get a more positive attitude created in the Bear organization. I'd gotten a call, and it was uh, Jim Finks. And he said, uh, he asked me, you know, how would I like to uh, play for the Bears? I said, it doesn't matter who I play for. I'm going to play as hard as I can. Chicago Bears, first round selection. Walter Payton, P-A-Y-T-O-N. Running back, Jackson State. One man alone can't turn an offense around, but in Walter Payton, the Bears have a player who can give it a tremendous boost. The scouts knew about Walter, but the public didn't know about him. You know, everyone said, who's Walter Payton? Well, he wanted to show people who Walter Payton was. The fourth overall pick hoped to make his Bear debut a special one. Instead, he gained zero yards on eight carries and instantly felt the wrath of a town that was tired of football failure. It's devastating because they were, they were dogging me out. Everybody would say, oh, he, he's going to be a bust. He can't even do this. He can't do that. After the game, when it came time, I was walking out of the stadium. My wife was with me, and he was walking along right next to us, and he had tears running down his cheeks. I think just out of instinct, she reached out and put her hand on his arm and she said, don't worry, it's going to be better. <laughs> she had pretty good insight. Peyton's transition to the pro game was a bit smoother during the rest of his rookie season. the year as the Bears leading rusher and the league's top kickoff returner. If you looked at it from, from a football standpoint, it was a lot easier than I expected. But if you look at it from a cultural aspect, it was definitely a shock. Having been raised in the South, Walter found it difficult adapting his rural roots to the big city lifestyle and the frigid weather of Chicago. Playing for a team that won only four games in his first year posed even more of a challenge. It was, uh, it was very, very difficult because you know, when you're so used to, uh, to coming from behind or, you know, overcoming odds and when you get up to the professional levels and, you know, it doesn't happen that way, it's, uh, it's kind of scary. Despite the Bears' lack of success, Peyton refused to even consider how things might have been better had he been drafted by another team. I felt at that time, it might not be the philosophy of, for people today, but I felt that was a coward's way. If you couldn't make it, with the team that you were drafted with then and you had to go somewhere else. That was, uh, to me, was a sign of failure. He recognized the Bears' lack of overall talent and was determined to fill that void. multi-talented Peyton realized early in his career that the Bears needed him to be more than just the best runner in the NFL. By playing here, I developed all my skills and I was able to do a lot of things. Whereas if I went to Pittsburgh because they had Stallworth and these other guys, Lance Swan, they wouldn't need me to catch passes. In an era of specialization, he became a true football renaissance man. I'm telling you that he was the best overall because he ran, he blocked, he tackled, he did he passed, he kicked, you know, he did everything you asked him to do and he'd do it. He would block, he'd block as hard as anybody I've ever seen, or he'd catch the ball and run with it, uh, receiving, he could do it all. Rolling out left, being chased by Browner, stops and eat the left side of the end zone for Peyton over the center.
running back with wide receiver-like skills, Walter remains the Bears' all-time leader in receptions. Despite his ability to excel as a receiver, his one true love was always passing. I remember Gary Fensick saying once that in all the years he was with the Bears, the Bears never had a quarterback who threw the ball more in practice than Walter did. And I love the, uh, the passing plays that I got a chance to throw. Dennison motion back toward the line, quick pitch to Walter, fakes the end around. Walter's going to throw! Man wide open! Touchdown, touchdown! In his career, the Bears quasi-quarterback threw eight touchdown passes. His finest aerial display took place in a game against the Saints. In addition to this 60-yard heave, he passed for another touchdown, ran for a score, and rushed for 161 yards. In 1984, when injuries devastated their quarterback core, the Bears used the versatile Peyton in some innovative offensive plays. While passing was his greatest love, his blocking may have been his greatest skill. And I think that's the greatest compliment you can give the guy who gained the most yardage in the NFL in history. That's the greatest compliment. He was probably as good a blocker as I've ever seen. No game demonstrated Walter's blocking prowess better than a key come from behind win in 85. With the Bears trailing late in the game, Jim McMahon was put in to save the day. He's chewing the gum with the uh, one eye half closed, and he calls pass and play, and I said, let's go. He walks up to the line, he's checking the line out. I'm checking the, uh, the defensive line out, too, because I see a guy kind of cheats up in there, and then I say, oh, God, he's coming. But my number one priority is, is outside. And I thought Walter checked the inside, then he came back out. But the guy on the inside was the most dangerous, just as he had to run his throat. He was reaching for McMahon. I kind of took him out of the picture. As I come away from the center, I stumbled a bit, and uh, that's when Walter came in and blocked the, the blitzing linebacker. Vikings coming out of blitz. McMahon back to throw. That play would have never happened if, if Walter would have came off and made that block. I mean, McMahon would have got murdered. Quite simply, Peyton was the quintessential all-around football player, the prototype for all others to emulate, a goal which continues to be difficult, judging from the fact that his diverse skills allowed him to accumulate over 21,000 combined yards, 5,000 yards more than his closest competitor. Bears founder George Hallis had an enormous impact on the people of Chicago. Early in Walter's pro career, the experience of being around Papa Bear left Peyton in awe. When you first meet him, the feeling that you have is sort of like, uh, I'm not worthy. Whenever he came around, you, you, know, you, got, uh, you got your act in order because you, you, you never knew what to say. You never knew how to approach him because you felt like, uh, Oh my God, this is the man. And it, it, was a, it was a humbling experience when you walk into his presence. Even today, images of Hallis remain etched in Peyton's memory. We were having a little trouble holding on to the ball, so he came in and I think he, he asked for a football, so I, I don't know if it was me or somebody that ran up to get it and came back and he said, this is where you hold it. Let's see, let's see the way you carry that ball. Yeah. That's right. As long as you get in that, they can't knock that thing. That's the most important thing right there. We had a fullback by the name of Decatie, and he just set a record of 13 fumbles. I showed him this the next season. He didn't have one. As a tribute to the Bears founder, Walter began the George S. Hallis Walter Payton Foundation, an organization designed to offer kids guidance and support in a friendly and safe environment. Our foundation is to make a difference, wherever that need or wherever that uh, positioning may be. 
and that's what we do. Walter's dedication to helping kids is evident even when it comes to the simplest of tasks. I'd like to get into a situation when you sign autographs that you interact with that person somehow. Or you ask him questions about where he's from, what he's doing. Walter, how are you? Nice to meet you, man. Pleasure's all mine. Ah, Who's that? That's my son, Simon. Hey, Simon, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> Can you sign his bowl for him? Be glad to. I have two kids, and I would, if they had an opportunity to meet, you know, one of their heroes, I would appreciate it if they, you know, would give the uh, courtesy to be just a little personal. Formed as a way to honor the man who meant so much to Walter, the foundation keeps the Hallis name and spirit alive. In just his third year as a pro, at the age of 23, Peyton became the youngest player ever to win the league's MVP. Despite his relative lack of experience, he had already established himself as a rare running back. I was probably a running that it wouldn't die easy. It's like one of those cowboy movies where a guy is, is, is coming at him and, and he gets shot once and he down. He gets shot again and he gets again and again and he's still walking. Then all of a sudden, big explosion go boom, arm over here, arm over there, leg over there, and they still trying to get together. That's the type of runner I was. His cowboy-like style can be traced back to his early football roots. My uh, college coach taught me that never, uh, never go easy. He had a, a defensive mindset in terms of being a running back and trying to deliver a blow. If somebody was going to hit him, he'd rather hit them first. It was relentless, and he ran with a fury. Uh, it was like he was mad all the time. He wanted to punish people. He wanted to just get at them and attack them. It seemed even when there was wide open field calling him, Walter opted instead to initiate contact. He wouldn't take way out by running through the sidelines. He'd come everywhere. You and him, he would come straight at him. I'm telling you, people just didn't want to tackle him. He punished him. He's a guy that you didn't want to play against uh, week after week after week because you knew he was going to get you. Every time he had the ball, it was an explosion on his part. One time I pulled up around the corner, Walter was behind me. And he said, don't hit the first guy, hit the second guy. I hit the second guy and sprung him for a long run. So back in the film session, we got a chance to take a look at it. And so my coach said, my office line coach said, how come you didn't hit the first guy? Walter whispered to me, don't hit him. I got him. He had great, great strength. And he had that flipper, as he called it, the forearm. His forearm was like Popeye's forearm. And if you watch the film, he would use that thing like a club. All the times we played him, I went into the game with one goal. Do not get straight armed by Walter Payton. But no matter how hard opponents tried, the straight arm could not be avoided. If a guy is, is coming to tackle you, his head has to be down like this and he, when, he, when he extends his arms. And if, he, if his head goes down as he extends his arms, that means he has a longer reach. If you get his head back, his arms are back, so he might not get a chance to grab you. Physical punishment was only part of Peyton's arsenal against defenseless defenders. It's kind of a little signature he had when he'd break out of a pack and get some open ground. He'd make a little jump, actually, and, and a kind of a stride in midair. And to me, it reminded me of a little show pony galloping around the ring. But the show pony kick was not just for show. I was quick, but not fast. That's why I developed that, uh, that stutter step or whatever it is, because 
you know, I could break away from 30 yards or 40 yards, but if I had to go 60, 70 yards, I'd probably get caught. The same footwork that once allowed him to rule the game of tag now left would-be tacklers embarrassed. They didn't know what you were going to do. They didn't know if you were going to go straight. They didn't know if you were going to come at them. They didn't know if you were going to stop. If you run down the sideline, this guy here, who's the defensive guy, he's already calculated in his mind where he's going to hit you at. He knows where you're going to be at at a certain time because he's judging your speed. So that's when I start my, my stutter step or whatever because what that does, it makes him change his speed. So you do that, so he has to think and then it gives you that edge and you meet you right by him. You knew he was going to make that one play, that one big gigantic leap. You just waited for it during the game. Peyton conquered gravity with the greatest of ease. We were playing the Detroit Lions, and he jumped over me, and I was standing straight up. And he jumped right over us, and that's incredible. And on those rare occasions when his leaping ability failed him, his determination allowed him to accomplish his goal. Everybody looks at this physical quality or that physical quality and forget about the heart. And the heart's what makes the great ones. Walter Payton, he's too short, too short in my butt. I mean, he got the heart. Too short, too slow, too small. And yet in the history of pro football, no other back had the ability to create something out of nothing like Payton. Even when everyone else assumed the play was over, Walter was still going fighting, clawing, doing whatever it took to excel. He's got great ability, great moves, great strength, and all that kind of stuff. His determination. His, his ability to carry the ball, you know, that many times a game, even when he's hurt, is his greatest asset. For 13 seasons, Walter played the most grueling position in sports. all kinds of weeks when at midweek he couldn't practice he could hardly walk he didn't want medication he didn't want to get shots he, he refused to get shot come Sunday he played I played games where I couldn't raise my right hand above my head I didn't have enough strength in it to raise it up if the measure of true greatness is the ability to endure then there is no one greater than Peyton a lot of times he got hurt, and people never realized how often he got all fucked up and bruised, but he kept on playing. Probably the best demonstration of his durability occurred on a cold November day in 1977. Despite being far less than 100%, Walter ran over the Viking defense for 275 yards. His record day remains the highest rushing game total ever. He had the flu so bad he was throwing up and had a fever, and he ran for 275 yards. In his career, Peyton played in 190 out of 191 games. The one game he did not play in took place during his rookie year against the Steelers. You thought that black smoke was going to come from his nose or something like that. He was so upset. Indeed, even today he remains upset at the assumption that he sat out because he was injured. It was not because I couldn't play. It still goes down as a game that you didn't play in, but uh, I was there. I was dressed out. It wasn't, wasn't the reason that I couldn't play. The coach decided to use uh, Mike Adamway, and Mike had a terrific game that game, so he didn't put me in. 
but I was ready to play, so everybody thinks, well, he only missed one game. I like to put a clear record up. He says he only missed one game because the coach decided not to put him in. I often wondered about his stamina, how he could just keep, keep going on and on and on like that. And then he once told me about his workout routine, his training routine, running, running those hills down in Mississippi on those deltas and burning out guys who'd come out to run with him, you know, track guys, burning them all out and, and torturing himself. He began running up sandbanks and levees at Jackson State when the stadium steps were inadequate for his training needs. His unique routine continued when he found the hill near his home in Illinois. There was no shades, no trees out there, nothing. Nothing but dust and, uh, and, and some dirt. Once you get halfway, you're thinking, I can stop. But the angle is so steep that if you stop, it's even harder to get started back. When you go down, you're not in control. The, the hill controls you. He had a regiment that was, that, that defied what the U.S. Marines would do. I brought Otis Wilson up there. I brought, uh, took Hanford Dixon there. They threw up, because it, it's, it's a mother. As solid physically as anybody I've ever seen. He was just uh, a rock. There it is. I kind of like, uh, liken him to, to, to James Brown, the hardest working man in showbiz. <laughs> Boy, uh, Walter Payton was one of the hardest working football players uh, to play out there. For many, the image of Walter and his hill will last forever. And perhaps it is fitting that no one else can ever claim to be king of that hill. They turned it into a part three golf course. It's not there anymore. During Peyton's first seven years, the Bears had only two winning seasons. In 1979, during a rare playoff appearance against the Eagles, the Bad News Bears reached an all-time low. Blockers for the penalty flag is wrong. Hey, break free! He might score! He's in the 50! Down the first side line, pumps the anchor and breaks through. And he goes all the way inside the 20 to 15 and 10 to 5. He dances into the end zone. But a flag was... What should have been a key touchdown, and Walter's longest run of his career, was instead called back. In 1982, owner George Hallis was tired of his team's losing ways, and in an attempt to turn it around, he hired former Bear Mike Ditka as his head coach. When uh, Mike came in, he said that, uh, you know, we're going to win the Super Bowl. Everybody looked around each other and said, oh yeah, you're right. He said, you can come along for the ride or you could get off. Either way, we're still going. During Ditka's first year, the team filled another piece of the puzzle when they drafted quarterback Jim McMahon. Come on, now, All you got to do is want it as much as we know yeah, we want it. You do. We want it that much. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, go, okay. Let's go. The Bears began to show signs of improvement. They won five of their last six games in '83. And for the first time, Walter could see a light at the end of the tunnel. In addition to having a competitive team, the Bears now also had other individuals who, like Walter, combined a tireless dedication on the field with an offbeat attitude away from it. Joker. He was one of the biggest jokers. He was a practical joker, as, as good as anybody. It didn't matter where or when, at any time or place, the joker was always lurking, ready to strike. He came in on a terrible cold day from practice. Somehow he was able to get in early. He locked the locker room and went in the shower, and the coaches and the players were all outside freezing. He's called my wife up a number of times. You know, just two weeks ago, he called her up. I'd call their house, and I'll uh, pretend like I was a female, looking for him, you know, crying and everything else. You know, about the old God, he, he told me he wasn't married and this and that. And he sounds like a girl, so, you know, he gets his voice up that high, and uh, she, he had my wife calling. Whether he was racing his cars, 
performing on stage or showing off his singing voice, Walter never took himself too seriously. The greatest love of all. You like that, huh? Yes, it's me, Michael Jackson. <laughs>
Play as hard as you can on every play. Anybody can affect the outcome of this game. Let's make sure we do our best at all times. Be smart and let's go after them. Come on. Walter led the charge against the Skins, rushing for over 100 yards. Performer's perfect pass enabled the Bears to taste playoff success for the first time in over 20 years. Get the tempo for the world championship, guys! Let's go! Let's go! Wait, out of here right now! Let's go! The win over Washington put the Bears into the NFC Championship game against the powerful 49ers. This long run by Walter was the first and last bright moment for Chicago. Here's Montana rolling out of the right side, looking toward the end zone, now throwing, fires, it's caught by Solomon, touchdown, 49! San Francisco overpowered the overmatched Bears, but even with the game already decided, Walter refused to go quietly. On the last play of the game, after the gun had already been sounded, Peyton was still fighting. greatest feeling that I ever had in football and the worst feeling I ever had in football. It was a week apart and uh, I, uh, after the loss against San Francisco, I thought, you know, it took almost 10 years to get here. I won't, you know, nine years, it'll be another nine years before we get back here and I won't be around. So, I, you know, those are things that go through your head and Wilbur Marshall in particular said, don't be holding your head down. You know, he was upset and he was bitter. He said, next year we come in, we, we're not just going to knock on the door, we're going to kick the damn door down. Well, here's another third down try for the Bears. Third and six from the 16 of Indianapolis. McMahon takes the snap, hands it off to Peyton. Big hole up the middle, to the 10, to the 5, to the end zone. Touchdown! Following Wilbur Marshall's plan, Walter and the Bears dominated the 85 season, rolling over opponents who a year before had stood in their way. lost only one game, captured the imagination of the entire city of Chicago, and earned a return trip to the playoffs against the New York Giants. I knew that if this was a good team we were playing, and it was just a matter of time, if they get on the roll, it would be hard for us to beat them. The Giants never got on that roll, thanks to some divine intervention. And when that happened, I had no doubts we were going to win the game. It was sort of like when he got ready to punt, George Hallis just took his hands from heaven and said, not today. Oh, he missed this! He missed this! Oh, right. The following week, Chicago's march to the title continued against the Rams. Soldier Field in Chicago, the NFC Championship, and a trip to New Orleans for Super Bowl 20. I always remember being on the field before a playoff game in 85 and hearing him in the middle of the huddle. And he sounded like a wild man. Kick ass, let everything hang out! Hey, my leg! Hey, my leg! Hey, my leg! Hey, my leg! Several key runs by Walter, and once again some help from above, confirmed that this was indeed a team of destiny. The 
snow started to fall, the crowd started to cheer. When that happened, it was sort of like nobody else existed on the football field except the Bears. And I think that was the ultimate for me. That, uh, that feeling that we're going to the Super Bowl was uh, the best feeling that I've uh, experienced in football. After 10 seasons, the greatest running back of all time had finally reached the biggest game of all time. Hey, this is it. Don't hold nothing back. This is it. Let's play our ass off, okay? Am I ready? 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 New England would accomplish little in this lopsided affair. Although they did succeed in one aspect of their game plan. New England's focus was Walter Payton. They said, we're going to stop Walter Payton. I mean, everywhere he went, there was two or three guys there with him. Uh, the one play I remember, the first play of the second half, where we were backed up in the end zone, I faked the ball to Walter, and you can see the whole defensive football team go after him. And I think that's, that's really what hurt the New England Patriots in that game. That was their downfall, worrying so much about Walter, they, they let everybody else uh, have a pretty good day. Looking back now, it seems almost appropriate. The greatest player ever, playing the ultimate team role of decoy in his team's finest hour. But at the time, Walter wanted to take a more starring role in his team's domination. And that was probably the most disturbing thing in my career at bottom is when you know, people said, well, you didn't give the ball to water to score in a Super Bowl. If I had one thing to do over again, I would make sure that he took the ball in the end zone. You know, he'd played for so long and, and been, uh, he'd, he'd been the Chicago Bears for so many years. And to see him not be able to get in that end zone, it, it had to hurt. I mean, it hurt me not seeing him score a touchdown. During his entire career, Walter felt that his individual accomplishments meant little when his team lost. Now he realized the same was true when his team won. It was a disappointing feeling at that moment. And then it was like, hey, after I realized you know, exactly what, uh, what it didn't mean, then it was okay. Finally being part of a winner and seeing how the city of Chicago reacted to that championship helped Walter get over any emptiness he may have felt. Ten years later, the Super Bowl trophy stands as the ultimate compliment to his perfect career. This was for you because you stood by us, you gave us the support, we had fun doing it, and thanks to you, we all can celebrate. In 1975, a young man from the South took his skills to the Windy City. In a short period of time, Chicago fell in love with and embraced its new favorite son. In fact, his motto became their motto. By the end of his career, he was as comfortable skating across the frozen turf as he was running along the sandbanks in Mississippi. In 1987, Walter Payton retired from pro football. went out on top, gaining over 100 yards in his final contest. At the very end, it was difficult to walk away from the game that had given him so much. I was just recapping some of the uh, great moments that was there, and I didn't want to rush through it because if you stay there long enough and these things would be etched in your mind and in your heart and soul, I always remember once I was talking with Bud Grant, and we were talking about Chuck Foreman. And I said, didn't he have an awful short career? Grant said he played five or six years. He said, that's about average for a running back. He said, you people in Chicago are spoiled. He said, this guy you have down there is a phenomenon. 
he was never, never gave an inch, always gave everything he had. And you knew that if you were a fan, an announcer, a player, a coach. I mean, he just was everything that you'd ever want in a football player. For 13 seasons, Walter Payton inspired wonder in all those who had the privilege to watch him play. His runs made fans marvel, and his unselfishness made 30-year-old, 300-pound linemen act like children. Myself or Noah Jackson, we'd run in the end zone, try to get the ball so you could spike it. That was kind of a good feeling, too. It made us feel as if we scored the touchdown. And maybe that is Walter's greatest gift. Not his athletic talent, but his unique ability to touch all those who came in contact with him. He was just a great, great person to play with. I'm just glad I was able to, to play with a guy like that. I loved playing against him. I loved watching him. There should be more Walter Payton's. His records and statistics are astounding, and yet to measure him by numbers alone would be short-sighted. I had the benefit of playing with him and against him. A real competitor, good person, uh, and tough. A true leader, a true role model, and a true person. In all the years of pro football, there has never been another player like him. So proud to be alive, coarse, strong, cunning, and pure. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Keep swinging. Ah. Keep bobbing your head. Through all your trials and your problems. Keep bobbing your head. Keep swinging. <laughs> Keep bobbing your head. Check it out. <laughs> The things you're hoping for And the evidence of what you can't see Don't let the trials that you're facing Get you stressed and can't be flexing Keep believing every day That he's already made a way It's working Oh, yeah Keep believing It's working You gotta keep swinging, swinging. You gotta keep pressing on. No. Race is not one till the end. But we got on your side. You can put the devil behind. Keep believing every day. It's a love of make a way. It's working it
So we did some smooth, man. He was, he was smooth as butter. I think he put the E in entertainment. I mean, he was a showman. He was all that you always wanted to be in a running back. I remember a lot of Walter Payton runs, you know, just from watching the one run where he's about to go down and look like he's about to jam his neck up and the guy hits him and he just comes straight up and spins off that guy and he's fighting and fighting and fighting. One of the things that I do want to do like Walter, but I never got a chance to, was every time he went to the end zone, he would always like high step, you know. I can never do that. <laughs> there have been many great backs come to the league, but there's only one that stands right now above the rest. And that's sure because of his his records and what he's been able to accomplish in this league. And that has to be Walter Payton.